For a half an hour last night, I was reminded of all the things that made me fall in love with pro wrestling from the jump. For a half an hour last night, I was that young kid in the 80s watching pro wrestling. For a half an hour last night, I was that teenager in the 90s watching pro wrestling. For a half an hour last night, I was that moron entering the uncertain world of adulthood in the 2000s watching pro wrestling. For a half an hour last night, I saw larger than life characters like The Undertaker in a story being told that had me on the edge of my seat. Now, cinematic wrestling matches may not be for everyone, but I'll be damned if I don't start this review off by saying thank you to Undertaker and AJ Styles. That was hella fun, man. And that's exactly what somebody like yours truly, the Amplified Man, that was something that was much needed for a decade, really. That was awesome. There's reports that Jeremy Borash was behind it. Whether he was or not, I fully could see why that would be the case. He's got history with the TNA Impact Matt Hardy. Deletion angles and storylines and matches. Which brings me to my biggest thank you, which is to Matt Hardy. Without Matt Hardy, I don't know if we see that type of match last night. Matt Hardy showed the wrestling world that it is not only okay, but if done correctly, a cinematic wrestling match can be pretty damn epic. There's no way I'm going a second more in this review without thanking Matt Hardy big time. He showed the world that that type of match can work in pro wrestling. And you put Undertaker and Styles in there last night in that cemetery setting. And that's what they delivered. I said from the moment AJ Styles and The Undertaker was announced for Mania that there was no way this was going to be a good wrestling match. Undertaker cannot hang with AJ Styles. Not at this juncture in his career. There has to be something added. Thankfully they listened. Whether it was to me or a million schmucks within the company itself. I don't care who they listened to. I'm just glad it got changed. At first we heard the words. Boneyard match. And our eyes rolled to the back of our dome pieces. Oh boy I can see where this is going we thought. But what they actually produced last night, what it actually ended up being, was basically a buried alive match in a cemetery. If that's the case, I'll take another Boneyard match in the future. But that was awesome. And I just wanted to send those thank yous out at the jump of this review. So Styles and Undertaker, but more specifically and more importantly, Matt Hardy, who showed the wrestling world that this can be done in an epic way if you just give it a chance. And it shows you what we've been lacking for 10 years now in this company. If you just put thought and care into what you are doing, if you get creative and if you have fun, this is the type of content that a billion dollar company, whether times are great or we're in times of adversity and we are in trying times, it doesn't matter if you are a billion dollar company and if you really care about what you're doing and you're truly having fun, that's the type of content you can produce. It doesn't just have to be for WrestleMania. Every single time I see a Stephanie McMahon, a Vince McMahon, or a Triple H interview, I'm always hearing about them talk about how hard it is to produce hours of content every week. Three hours on Raw, two hours on SmackDown, two hours NXT, the pay-per-views. We're always hearing about how hard it is. And nobody's questioning that it is hard. But very rarely do we hear them talk about how fun it is, how creative they get to be, how energized, how passionate, how amplified they are, how they don't feel there's enough hours of content being produced. That's the type of mindset that I would love to hear from them. Instead, it's always just how hard it is. And you can tell in these interviews that they're phoning it in. 
They took the quick money grabs. They took the billion dollars for two hours of programming on Fox. They revamped their three-hour telecast every Monday night on the USA Network. But it's clear that they're not willing to put in the time and the effort, the creativity. It's clear that their passion is no longer in that company. The passion is no longer for pro wrestling. And that's never more evident than what we see and what we have seen in the last 10 years. Last night, in that Boneyard match with Undertaker and Styles, that, my friends, is the type of content we should be getting on the regular. And I'm not just narrowing this to just a cinematic match like we saw last night, but content that actually takes a storyline and its characters out of the norm, outside of the box, giving us something truly unique. Something that truly makes us go, wow, that was awesome. How many times in that company can we say that within the last 10 years? Not often enough. So when I see something like that, yes, it's so awesome to see, but I can't also help but think, where the fuck has this been for 10 years? You know, it takes somebody like Matt Hardy to get that creative and original to show everyone that it can work. It takes individuals like Bray Wyatt and that type of creativity, but their suggestions go in one ear and out the other for the old man in Stanford. He doesn't want to hear it. I hope after last night when they see that that match was the most talked about. I hope that they then see their holes in the company. And I hope that they begin to change. Fill those holes. But that's just one man's dreams, I guess. Allow me to introduce myself. My name is BC Amplified. To my Amplified unit, welcome to WrestleMania 36 Night 1, the good, the bad, and the ugly. By now, every other pro wrestling content creator has given you their thoughts and opinions on Night 1 of the big event. Some had videos up within hours. Some went live on streams immediately after the event. They all just couldn't wait to give you their thoughts and opinions. That's adorable. And then there's the mad scientist and creative genius of the pro wrestling YouTube world, BC Amplified. The best is always saved for last. And when it comes to the Amplified, man, I'm not interested in giving my audience just thoughts and opinions. You see, I deliver facts based on thorough research. I break down characters, examine storylines, and dissect matches for these reviews. Not so I can be the most knowledgeable son of a bitch in this community. I do it so that we all, my amp unit, can be the most knowledgeable some bitches in this community. And together, when our voices need to be heard, we can help change the entire industry for the better. This review will make you think vividly, question intently, and learn passionately. You'll agree and disagree along the way, but the entire time you will be entertained. To my veteran subscribers, you know the deal by now, and you know what comes next. But for my newer subscribers, allow me to explain how this works. We are going to review the entire match lineup for night one of WrestleMania 36. Every match will get one tally, at least one tally, in one of these columns. The good, the bad, and the ugly. At the end of this review... We add up the tallies in every column and come to a final decision. Was this a good or bad pay-per-view? You desperately want to stay away from the ugly column. Because when we do the final count at the end of this review, the uglies get crossed off and each ugly turns into two bads. That drastically changes the outcome in deciding if this was a good or bad pay-per-view. So bottom line... Stay away from the ugly column. Hopefully none of these matches go there, but I'm already starting to think about what I just witnessed last night, and something tells me that ain't happening. So buckle up, get your snacks, your Capri Suns, your beers, your coffees, whatever you need. Kick your feet up. And for the better part of the next hour, let's get amplified on WrestleMania 36, night one. This is the good 
the bad, and the ugly. We start the show with a heartfelt message from Stephanie McMahon, finally. This is what I've been asking for the last three weeks since they started at the PC. Just be honest with your audience. Don't assume that everybody is a smart fan or a diehard fan that knows the behind the scenes of what's going on in pro wrestling, why decisions are being changed, why things are being rearranged, why plans fell through. Talk to your casual fan. Talk to your younger audience. Give reasons. Explain why these last minute changes are being made. Even if you gotta make something up. Not everybody is reading a dirt sheet or not everybody has a source or knows somebody in the know. Not everybody knows a guy who knows a guy. Talk to your full base. Have a heartfelt message with them and for them. They just show up at the PC weeks ago like nothing, no message planned. Last second, they changed the Universal Championship match. No explanation. They turn a tag team title match into a singles competitor match for WrestleMania. All the while, not explaining a damn thing. Again, if you're a diehard fan, if you are that smart that knows what's going on behind the scenes, not just in the world then you know exactly what's going on. But even that diehard fan, even that smart fan, they want an explanation because we want to know that you care. Vince, we want to know that you actually give a damn. Put some thought into the changes made. Give an explanation. Nothing. Not one McMahon got in front of the camera during these trying times through this adversity and gave a heartfelt message. And I'll tell you why, because they don't give a damn. After three weeks, we finally got that from Stephanie McMahon. I think that is awesome and reassurance for that casual fan, for that younger fan. Some transparency, some honesty, instead of acting like it's business as usual, when even that casual and that younger fan realizes, understands from the jump, that this is anything but business as usual. Being honest with them and saying, listen, this isn't business as usual, but we are trying X, Y, and Z. Have that transparency. Because without that, even the casual, even that young fan is going to shit on your product. Because nothing's going to make sense. I used this example in last week's podcast. That's like going into WrestleMania 5, the main event, Macho Man versus Hulk Hogan. And the night before, they switch out Hulk Hogan for Tito Santana. And you don't even explain it. The next night on WrestleMania, we're just getting Macho Man versus Tito Santana. What the fuck happened to Hulk Hogan? They didn't even care to explain shit. That's like watching a tag team title match back in the day between Demolition and the Legion of Doom, the Road Warriors. Tag team titles on the line, but we're only going to have Animal versus Smash. One on one, but for the tag titles. What? Why? Give an explanation. Explain. Even if you got to make something up, be creative. You're a billion-dollar company. Act like it. Act like you care. I know I'm hung up on that heartfelt message from Stephanie McMahon last night, guys, but it's those little things. These are the things that make or break a billion-dollar company, and these are the things that make people like yours truly, that dissect this business through and through, in and out, These are the things that make me realize from the jump that they don't care. I'm glad they at least took 60 seconds last night. One fucking McMahon got in front of a camera and just admitted it's not business as usual. But this is the deal. Don't lie. 
Don't act like everything's a bed of roses. There's people out there, I'm one of them, that wants an explanation on what, why you're doing things. Explain to me. Explanations help in the long run. Then Grunk cuts an opening promo with Mojo. It wasn't horrible. <laughs> it could have ran off the tracks in the first 10 seconds. Now they probably filmed this about 27 times before Gronk got it right. He looked nervous as hell. But he delivered. Good job for Gronk. Mojo entered, and he didn't make a complete fool of himself either. They went back and forth, hyping up the event for about 30 more seconds, and that was it. So far, nothing tragic. We started the night off action-wise with the women's tag title match, the Kabuki Warriors versus Alexa Bliss and Nikki Cross. These four ladies were given a full 15 minutes to perform, and that's exactly what they did. Asuka and Kyrie put on a heel tag team clinic. Everything you should do as a heel tag team, Asuka and Kyrie did to perfection. On the flip side, Alexa Bliss and Nikki Cross put on their best main roster performance to date. I don't know what that's truly saying for them. But when you think about what Nikki Cross was doing in NXT, and what she has been since she's gotten to the main roster, that's sad. That's absolutely depressing. You had hopes that Nikki Cross would be so much better. As far as Alexa Bliss, you look at her accolades. Five times she's held the Raw or SmackDown championship. She's already held the tag team championships before. But yet you never really felt like she was putting on dynamite matches. No pun intended to AEW. But you never felt like she was deserving of all of those championships. When Asuka's over here holding a singles championship just one time. And for a very short length of time. Hell, Alexa Bliss has more singles championships than Sasha Banks. And Sasha Banks' full title reigns, all four of them, equal just over a month. Alexa Bliss's, you put them all together, a fucking year. Plus. You never really felt like she earned those, though, match-wise. Last night was one of those matches where you said, okay, she looked like a pro wrestler in there. And I know she has it in her. I just don't get it enough out of her. I've dissected so many of these matches from these ladies. And I can honestly say, for Nikki Cross and Alexa Bliss, that was their best main roster performance in that match. And again, the heel tag team work of Asuka and Kairi Sane just shows you why they're two of the best female wrestlers today. It's what I always say. Give these wrestlers the time and let's see who sinks or swims. Nobody sunk here. Well done. The finish, I couldn't stand. Not just because Asuka and Kairi dropped the titles <laughs> after a beyond lackluster title reign but also because it was a botched finish. While Alexa did good in this match, it was clear she hit the twisted bliss on Kyrie's legs in nowhere near her midsection. So I'm stuck with a hard decision here. It was a good match, for the most part, but not a good ending. So I'm going to do this. I'm not going to penalize any of these ladies. They busted their asses. First match of the night's always one of the hardest. This match is going to go into the good column. But let me be clear. The main reason this goes into the good column is because now, finally, both Asuka and Kyrie can begin the process of getting the fuck out of WWE. It is clear the old man in Stanford doesn't see anything in them, and that is criminal, but it is fact. So now there's nothing tying them down anymore. They don't have Vince McMahon's property around their waist or over their shoulder anymore. If I'm Kyrie or Asuka, I walk, I run away from that company ASAP as fast as possible.
But that's the most good that I can pull out of this match. Asuka and Kyrie are finally free. Let your contracts roll and go somewhere that appreciates you. Other than that, I didn't mind this opening match. I felt they busted their asses. Whether you enjoyed it or not, whether you thought it was good or not, that's in the eye of the beholder. But I'm not going to penalize them. They went out there for the first match, and for 15 minutes, they put in the work. And that's the best thing that I like to see these wrestlers do, man. Show me that you care. Show me that you're willing to go out there and put it all on the line. And as long as there's no surrounding factors that are absolutely horrible or tragic, I'll put it into the good column. I'm not just the mean boogeyman on YouTube that just looks for the bad, that just calls out negative. First match, I didn't hate it. I'm putting it into the good column. Match number two was Baron Corbin versus Elias. These two were given 10 minutes. This could have been pretty damn bad. They could have went 15 to 20 minutes and Corbin could have won. Instead, it was rather short and Elias won. You add in the fact that neither individual took a moment off and this goes into the good column. And for the record, the main reason it goes there is because Elias finally got a moment. Diminished due to the circumstances? Absolutely. But a moment nonetheless. And he needed this win so damn bad. And Elias got it. Again, there was not enough here that I can put this into a bad column. Ten minutes. It was short enough. The right dude won. And I just think about if they actually put some stock in Elias, what, what this could do for him going forward. So I'm putting that into the good column. So here we are two matches in, and we have two in the good column back to back, proving that I am not just the mean guy on YouTube or the asshole that inflates the negativity in pro wrestling. No, I just try to be truthful with you guys always. I review with fact-based research and clear-headed dissection of every character, match, and story. This review is already proof that I seek the positive in pro wrestling, and I want desperately to talk positively about pro wrestling. Unfortunately, there just isn't enough positivity to talk about these days. And the reason I became a respected reviewer with thousands of subs and viewers is not by bullshitting, but by being brutally honest. The day that I'm not is the day that I end this channel. We're two for two so far. Can we keep it going? Unfortunately, the answer is absolutely not. The next match and third match on the card was the Raw Women's Title match. Becky Lynch, the champion, versus Shayna Baszler, the challenger. And long story short, Lynch defeated Baszler in just over eight minutes. Please think about that. Becky Lynch tied Shayna's arms up in roll-up fashion and pinned her middle of the ring. That, my friends, is Shayna Baszler's booking. That, my friends, is WrestleMania's booking for your Raw Women's Championship. They give them eight minutes... And they take this badass female that was one of the best wrestlers in pro wrestling for over a year in NXT. Nobody could beat her. She held that title for months and months. She was built up to be a legit badass. A force to be reckoned with. And when she's about to win the Royal Rumble... The old man in Stanford, last minute, like he always does, makes a change and puts his blonde bombshell Charlotte Flair as the victor. So then you think, okay, she's getting the consolation prize. She's now going to win Elimination Chamber. And they had her destroy everybody in just a few minutes in the Elimination Chamber. So this 50-50 type yo-yo booking of Shayna Baszler already in her first two months on the main roster... 
That's how we're kicking things off. You already saw the writing on the wall. You already saw what a travesty this was from what she was in NXT. But you were hoping, you were hoping that they wouldn't get it wrong on the grandest stage of them all. And there is Shayna Baszler, your beast, your badass force. At one time, here she is on the main roster, getting pinned in eight minutes by a simplistic, arms tied up roll up type of finish. Anybody that is okay with that type of WrestleMania title booking, first and foremost, but on top of that, anybody that is okay with that type of booking for Shayna Baszler. That's a level of stupidity that I never want to fuck with. And I don't know how you wound up on this channel. Even if you're a diehard Becky Lynch fan, you need to learn something right now. You do not book somebody up by tearing somebody down. You have to be creative. You have to be more thoughtful than that. You have to know how can we showcase Shayna Baszler the best possible way if indeed... The final outcome that we want is Becky Lynch walking away with that title. But how can we make Baszler look strong as fuck? That was the opposite. There is no way possible, no way imaginable, and no way that anybody could ever ask me to put that in any column but the ugly column. And that, my friends, is where it's going. And the only reason it's going into the ugly column is because I don't have a travesty column. I don't have a tragic column. That's how you're booking Shayna Baszler. But how can we be shocked? How can we be surprised? Look what they did to Bray Wyatt on a Thursday afternoon when kids were in school and grown-ups were at work. Look what they did to Bray Wyatt, the hottest character in pro wrestling at the time, The Fiend. So I shouldn't be shocked, but I'm still befuddled and dumbfounded at the level of stupidity that this company can keep on reaching. A new low, time after time. Lower than I ever thought imaginable. So just like that, we were off to a good start. I was being uber generous. And in one fast eight-minute swoop... That ugly, don't forget, turns into two bads in the final count. So we're tied up already. All because they didn't want to care. The fourth match of the night was the IC title match. Champion Sami Zayn versus Daniel Bryan. Guys, full disclosure, I didn't think there was any way possible that this match was going anywhere but the good column. I mean, look at who we're talking about. Sami Zayn and Daniel Bryan. Yet here I am, befuddled and mind-boggled that they gave these two world-class wrestlers just over eight minutes. Sound familiar? Not a second more. In the finish, saw Debray eat a halluva kick and get pinned. Before the match even hit a climax, this finish came out of nowhere. And not in a good way, right? An RKO out of nowhere, that's fun. This was sheer stupidity. And I'm being generous by putting this into the bad column. Daniel Bryan, Sami Zayn. This should have been a professional wrestling clinic. Instead, it was an eight-minute farce, an eight-minute sham. I didn't even care who walked out with the championship. I wanted Zayn and Bryan booked to be Zayn and Bryan. I wanted Zane and Brian to deliver what Zane and Brian can deliver. He just didn't care to give them enough time. That uh, if you blinked, this match was done. That halluva kick, and you're thinking this is Daniel fucking Brian. You remember him just a few years ago, WrestleMania 30. And he's getting fucking kicked in his dome pit, and that's it. So we started off so good, the first two matches. The last two matches, the train started to go right off the track. And unfortunately, friends, we couldn't put it back at that moment, at that time. Because next up, 
the fifth match on the card. This was the tag team title match for the blue brand. And what I'm about to do may seem harsh. But understand whether you're old school or new school, a tag team title match in any language, in any country involves tag teams. But not in WWE. You see, the old man got himself into a pickle and backed himself into a corner by not postponing or rescheduling WrestleMania. And when shit went down, when people went down and plans needed to be changed, Vince McMahon didn't even bother to make sense of anything. Strowman replacing Roman against Goldberg later in the night was only the tip of the iceberg, again, with no explanation. For this tag team title match, the old man had John Morrison versus Kofi Kingston versus Jimmy Uso. That's right. A one-on-one-on-one triple threat ladder match. No tag teams involved, yet the tag team titles were on the line. I'm going to say that again so we can comprehend this. A tag title match with no tag teams competing. And there's people okay with that because it was a good match, BC. People are willing to overlook the stupidity of this company and just say, well, times are tough, their hands were tied. This is the only thing Vince could do, BC. You're willing to accept that BS. I'm not. And I hear BC, the match was match of the night, BC. I don't care if it was the match of the century. Are you understanding? Are you comprehending what we are witnessing? And it's because of the old man's decisions. It was a domino effect. One bad decision after another. This isn't just because the Miz fell under the weather. The Miz was hit with the Wabaka going around the globe. Or anybody else. This was because McMahon made the bad decisions from the jump. So then, when things happened beyond their control, even then, they didn't try to make sense of it all. They didn't give a clear explanation. They didn't have full transparency with their audience. Instead, the casual fan is watching a tag team title match with individuals. Singles competition. You're willing to say it was the greatest thing ever because the match was good. And by the way, it was good. That's it. I've seen so many epic ladder matches. I will not be putting that there. But yes, it was absolutely a good match. And those three individuals went out there and performed. I would expect no less. I would hope so. There are three dudes that are fully capable on putting on a badass ladder match. I'm not going to get carried away and call it the, the greatest thing since sliced bread. I'm too busy over here trying to decipher through the bullshit. They never bothered to explain anything. They just assumed that everybody would be okay with the BS because these are trying times. Then don't put on a tag title match if you don't have tag teams competing. I am old school. And to me, a tag team title match involves tag teams. I think it is a farce and exposes the business if you have tag titles on the line and both individuals aren't even in the match. That's what I mean when I say this may seem harsh. But this has to. It has to go into the bad column. I know, I'm the mean guy right now. BC, the match was good, man. I know. I feel you. I really do, guys. I try always to give the performers the advantage over bad booking. But sometimes, I just can't lower my standards to that level. These three busted their asses. But it wouldn't have mattered if John Morrison hit a moonsault from the top of Home Depot onto Kofi Kingston's car in the parking lot. The match delivered, but it was not as advertised. It's a tag title match with no tag teams competing. There comes a time in every honorable reviewer's content 
where we have to hold this company accountable. This is one of those times. Unapologetically, this goes into the bad column. If you're wondering about the finish, all three men retrieved the titles atop the ladder, but Morrison ended up with them after falling from the ladder and onto another. It was a hokey pokey finish, but that did not add to my decision because the match was so good enough that the finish wouldn't have mattered. Not epic, but it was absolutely good enough to outweigh a poor finish. Unfortunately, it's one of those moments where booking is going to be the final deciding factor. I hope you guys understand. I know after that match ended last night and you were thinking about the Amplified Good, the Bad, and the Ugly review, you're thinking this is an absolute good, and BC may even make a great column because of that match. No, I'm not following the hype. I, re I went back and I rewatched it. It was a ladder match. Exactly what I would expect from them. The praise that they're getting, that's awesome. They busted their asses, they deserve it. But this review is so many factors coming together. It's a lot of different scenarios and a lot of aspects of a match. And booking is included. And there comes those times where if the booking is so nonsensical, it's so much bullshit that I can't look past it. As I said, I try to always give the performers the edge. This is not one of those scenarios. And it really pains me to do such because I respect every every ounce of work that these individuals go into that ring or outside the ring and give us. But I wouldn't be doing my job if this didn't go into the bad column. Vince McMahon, the owner of that company, the WWE as a company, as an entity, they need to know that these decisions are not right. Even in trying times, you have to care about what you're doing. You have to put thought and explain shit. You have to give reasoning. They don't care. That is the theme of this company for 10 years now. He is okay with just having a tag title match with three dudes. A singles match. Not on my watch. It's unacceptable. Unapologetically, guys, that goes into the bad column. And I know, I'm once again the mean guy on YouTube. I'm the overly negative guy. I'm too harsh, I'm too extreme, and too critical with these reviews. No, I'm just bluntly honest. Match 6 was Kevin Owens versus Seth Rollins. They went 10 minutes before Rollins gets himself DQ'd. This was easily going into the ugly, ugly column at that moment, but Owens doesn't want it to end that way. Nor did I, nor did any of us. So Owens is able to get Rollins back into the ring, and the match is restored. Under no DQ, no count-out rules. And when the match restarted, it was physical as fuck. Steel chairs, ring bells, steel steps, all used. But the ending sequence was just great. Owens flies from the top of the WrestleMania sign located behind commentary, crazy high above, and landing onto Rollins below and through the commentary table. Once back in the ring, Rollins pleads to Owens, Please, Kev, it doesn't have to end like this. But Owens stunners Rollins anyway and collects the win. This is clearly going into the good column. And that's saying a lot, guys, because when Rollins got himself DQ'd the first time, I was like, all right, that's, this is exactly what I thought, man. And this is skipping the bad. This is going directly into the ugly. And there we were seven minutes later, and it was going into the good column. Owens taking that chance, man. Going up on that WrestleMania sign. Getting creative. Doing the deed. Taking the risk. And I love how they teased the DQ finish. Because they knew. That's what everybody was expecting. Because that's WWE's MO. That's something they absolutely would do. Because they've done it time and time again. But they teased it. And then we got the best of the match. In the next 7-10 to 10 minutes. I just thought that was absolutely great. Um, but there is no great column because WWE hasn't done enough great consistent shit. When they start doing that, you'll see a great column. The good, the great, the bad, and the ugly. <laughs> but match number six, Rollins and Owens, that goes into the good column. Before 
Cutting to another match, R-Truth tries hiding from the locker room with his 24-7 title by hanging with Grok, Gronk and Mojo. Grok? <laughs> Grok mania. So Truth is trying to hang with Gronk and Mojo. He's trying to hide and hang with Gronk and Mojo up at the PC platform high above the ring. But Gronk and Mojo both have the same idea to pin Truth. Gronk goes for the pin, but Mojo makes sure that that doesn't happen. Instead, getting the pin for himself and winning the 24-7 title again. He even has some words for Gronk. Something like, you want it, come get it, or all day, every day, or 24-7, baby, or some stupid shit that Mojo would say. And he walks off, leaving Gronk puzzled. So something tells me that on night two, tonight for WrestleMania, Gronk is going to pin Mojo. Watch for that, guys, because Gronk is the host of the entire WrestleMania. Gronk will be back for night two tonight. Look for Gronk to pin uh, Mojo. Not that anybody cares. But I did feel this was a good break in the action. It doesn't go in any of the columns. It wasn't an actual fucking match, even though a title changed hands. But come on, it's a 24-7 title, man. This doesn't get a check mark. <laughs> but it was a good break in the action. The seventh match of the night was the Universal Championship. Champion Bill Goldberg versus Braun Strowman, the challenger. That's right, no explanation, but that's the MO of this company. Braun Strowman is just in the match. The match was three minutes in length, and Strowman becomes new Universal Champion after four power slams. Which, by the way, was after no selling four spears beforehand. This obviously and absolutely goes into the ugly section. And again, I've said this already in this review... That's only because I don't have a tragic section. Look, guys, if they built Braun like a beast the entire time, then I can absolutely work with this decision. But they made Braun to look like an absolute bum way too many times. Even recently, he couldn't even hold the IC title more than a couple weeks. And this company replaces him for Roman with without any explanation, and it has him destroy Goldberg in three minutes. It makes zero sense. You didn't book Braun properly to do what he did to Goldberg last night. So how are we all supposed to just jump on board? If Vince did this correctly, that's one thing. I can get behind that decision. And you want to say, BC, it's because of these... These times and what happened to Roman and Roman pulling out, Vince had no choice. Yes, he did have a choice. A, he should have been booking Braun like a beast the entire time. Like an actual monster among men. That's A. And then we wouldn't have had this issue. B, explain shit. Full transparency with your audience. Make people understand and even buy into the fact that Braun is a part of this match. If you don't do that, this whole thing is a farce. And on top of that, how can I not feel bad for Bray Wyatt, who is the one guy that got shafted during this whole process? When it's all said and done, do you guys realize the hottest character in pro wrestling was sacrificed for a Braun Strowman title win in three minutes? Fuck! So let's get our dome pieces back in the right direction. The main event for night one of WrestleMania 36 is the Boneyard match. Undertaker... Versus AJ Styles. Styles arrives to the Boneyard in a hearst. Taker rolls up rocking on his motorcycle to Metallica. American badass style. I just thought the whole opening sequence of this was, man, it just got me in the mood. I was already, before they started coming to blows, I was already edge of my seat. And for the next half an hour, what I grew up loving about pro wrestling... I got it. Guys, I mean, they went all over this boneyard slash cemetery. This was basically a buried alive match because we saw the... We saw the spot where somebody was going in, the tractor full of dirt, ready to be dumped on an individual. We know how this thing was ending. So it was basically a buried alive match in a cemetery. That's what a boneyard match is. And they brawled all over. I mean, there were shovels being used. They were going through barns. They were fighting on top of shacks and sheds. <laughs> Gallows and Anderson were involved at one point. Like 10 druids 
came to jump the Undertaker, but Taker was able to overcome all of them. There was one moment where Styles had Undertaker. They were talking a lot of shit, too. This was fully filmed cinematically, guys. This was like a movie. It even had cheesy music that I could have done without, but it is what it is. Beggars can't be choosers, and I'm taking all of that. But there was one point where Styles had Taker down and out, and he talked a whole bunch of shit, calling him too old, and this is it. Let me just bury you. Let me end this once and for all. He puts him into this grave site. He gets into the tractor, starts it up. He's about to dump the dirt, and all of a sudden, we see this shining light behind him, and the Taker arises from out of nowhere. Anybody else... You would say, come on, this is hokey pokey bullshit. But The Undertaker, this is what he's done for the better part of 30 years. So you're absolutely invested in believing into that character, that he would do that. Even though he was mostly American badass in this Boneyard match, he was still Taker with all of his powers, if you will. And he gets the upper hand. And he gets AJ Styles on top of this barn or huge shed, shack, whatever it was. And he throws Gallows off of it. He tombstones Anderson on it. And he choke slams AJ Styles off of it. And he comes back down slowly, descends down a ladder. And he talks a whole bunch of shit. At, at this point, AJ Styles is begging, pleading to The Undertaker, please, please. Don't bury me alive. Don't bury me alive. Please, Taker. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And Taker's like, you're sorry, huh, boy? You're sorry, huh? Don't do that. Go out like a man, AJ. Go out like a go out like a man, Alan. <laughs> he was calling him by his real name, too. But he was telling him, don't say you're sorry, man. Go out like a man. In other words, have some pride. It's over for you. Go out like a man. I just love that interaction. And he kept telling Styles, what's my wife's name, boy? You remember my wife's name? How old am I, AJ? How old am I now? I'm too old, aren't I, AJ? And he, he was talking that shit before he dumped him into this gravesite. At first, he taps on my shoulder. He goes, all right, kid, I ain't going to bury you alive. I ain't going to bury you alive. You gave me one hell of a fight. And he goes to turn around like he's going to walk away. But then he looks. He gives that taker stare. And he boots him. Across his dome piece. Styles falls flat on his back. Six feet down into this gravesite. Taker gets into the tractor. Starts that some bitch up. And dumps that whole pile of dirt on top of Styles. Styles tries to get his glove up. He doesn't want to get buried alive. But that's all we see. Is Styles' glove. His head never reaches the surface. Only his glove was able to get up. Taker gets on his motorcycle after, by the way, raising his right fist and the whole shed just catches fire and fiery pro uh, pyro <laughs> promo. Fiery pyro just goes up, man. It looked awesome. The Undertaker symbol was in the middle of this barn shed. It was fucking awesome. He gets on his motorcycle, Metallica starts blasting again, and he rides off. And I love the last visual. With the WrestleMania WWE copyright logo in the bottom right corner. That symbolizes that the show is over. And you just hear Metallica fading away. With the sounds of the motorcycle riding off into the night. And we end WrestleMania. Man, The Undertaker felt like The Undertaker last night, dude. And I said it from day one. Styles and Undertaker is not going to be a classic wrestling match. It's not even going to be a good wrestling match. That was my main concern. Something else needs to be added to this. I'm glad they listened. I'm not just saying to me. I'm not giving myself a pat on the back. I think enough people knew that something more needed to be added to this match. There's no way Taker could hang with AJ Styles in a wrestling match. They switched it to this weird Boneyard match title. But no matter how stupid the name sounded, the match more than delivered. And it brought me back to every reason why I loved pro wrestling in the first place. I cannot say enough good things about that match. It's actually getting... I don't know if I've ever done this before, but I'm doing it now. Because I don't have a great column. And WWE hasn't done enough to make me put in a great column. Once they start doing great shit consistently, I'll do such. But this match is getting two in the good column. A, for the way it was produced in a cinematic feel, and them actually finally giving a shit about their product. The company actually cared about what they were doing. 
and the fact that these two busted their ass and were completely badass during this fight slash match slash ordeal <laughs> whatever you want to call it slash movie it was fucking awesome this gets two goods beyond a shadow of a doubt again we heard that Jerry, Jeremy Borash who used to do Matt Hardy's uh, broken ultimate deletion those type of things uh, over in TNA Impact we're hearing that he had a big hand in this um, should that be the case I, I totally could see that but Matt Hardy definitely deserves a lot of credit because he reintroduced cinematic type pro wrestling matches uh, back to the world of pro wrestling. I mean, the closest thing we ever saw to this in WWE for WrestleMania was the back uh, backlot brawl when they were in California. Roddy Piper versus Goldust, WrestleMania 12. And that was nothing uh, like cinematic like this. I mean, uh, you really got to give Matt Hardy credit here. He showed the wrestling world that this can be done, and if done correctly, it could be pretty fucking epic. I can't say enough good things about this matchup, guys. And that's where we stand. Two goods on this one. So when it's all said and done for night one of WrestleMania 36, the good, the bad, and the ugly review, my tally has five in the good, two in the bad, two in the ugly. So on the surface, you're saying, BC, five in the good, that's more than any other column. But don't forget the rules. For the final count, each ugly gets crossed out and turns into two bads apiece. So if you cross those two uglies out, each becomes two bads apiece. You just added four bads into the bad column. So our final tally is five good Six in the bad. Even though The Undertaker and AJ Styles made this a lot closer than maybe it should have been. Even though I was more generous than I probably should have been. This still ended up being a bad pay-per-view special event as a whole overall. It had its moments, but not enough. And again, thinking back at the finishes... The booking of Shayna Baszler in just eight minutes, dropping that match the way she did. Braun Strowman winning that championship in three minutes, and that's how you do the Fiend Bray Wyatt dirty? You give eight minutes to Sami Zayn and Daniel Bryan, and you have it finished like it did. Tag team titles are on the line with no tag teams competing. I understand the situations and the circumstances, that doesn't mean you curl up in a ball, phone it in, don't explain shit, just throw anything out there. Still has to make some sense. There has to be some type of transparency. You have to make rational calls. You took the Miz out of the tag team title match and you say, well, what else do you want him to do? I mean, it's one-on-one-on-one. -on -one -on -one. I have no issue with that. Okay, but then tonight, they're throwing in Austin Theory to replace Andrade. So that it's an official tag team title match. And it's going to be Austin Theory tagging up with Garza. Well, if you're just throwing people like Austin Theory, that's had one main roster match. And by the way, he lost that match. That was last week. <laughs> well, if you're doing that tonight, then why the hell was last night's tag team title match one on one on one? Uh, this, is, this is what I'm saying. How can I be the only one that not only is thinking about this nonsensical bullshit, but how can I be the only one that cares? I'm not going to sit back and say, please, sir, can I have some more to the old man in Stanford? Everything he dishes out, I'm not going to be the first one in line ready to accept it. By one tally, and again, I'm being a lot more gracious than I could have been and probably should have been. By one tally, night number one of WrestleMania 36 was a bad pay-per-view event thank you to styles though and AJ, in, 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 in aj <laughs> styles and the undertaker thank you so much you guys made this closer than it should have been could have been so to them awesome um and now we go on to night number two and we'll see what they actually produce um this looks like the weaker part of the card actually it's got its matches edge and randy orton and john cena and bray wyatt and after that, 
you know, Drew McIntyre in Lesnar has potential. But man, that moment for Drew McIntyre should have been in front of tens of thousands of people. I just don't know how this is really going to come across. You know he's winning tonight, that title. I just don't know how this is going to come across in front of nobody. Um, so I'm kind of reserved on that. And then you have um, just a, a bunch of... You got Rhea Ripley and Charlotte Flair. You got the five-pack challenge for Bailey's championship. You got the street bums, Montez Ford and Doughboy taking on the aforementioned team of Garza and Austin Theory. Um, Bobby Lashley is taking on Aleister Black. So you got some subpar matches tonight too. We'll see. We'll do this again tomorrow morning, guys. The good, the bad, and the ugly of WrestleMania 36, night number two. So you know where to find me, man. There ain't going to be no quick vid later tonight. There ain't going to be any live streams or anything like that. You guys are asking me more and more for that. And guys... I, I want to be the I want to be what you guys deserve, man. The best reviewer in this community. I can't do that if I'm just spewing off my thoughts and opinions moments after it happened. As much as that might be fun, I'm trying to change the pro wrestling world for the better. I'm trying to make people see that we can be getting better. I'm not here for fun and games. I'm glad I am entertaining for all of you. That's awesome. But I'm, I have a mission to accomplish here, man. I'm trying to change shit for the better. I like to sleep on shit, make sure I have all my ducks in a row, all my thought process, everything is clear, ready to rock. I have my research done. I have all the breaking news over the, over the 12 hours past the event that, that are needed to be presented to you guys. I want to make sure that I am the most fact-based channel and reviewer an analyst in this community. I can't do that if I'm tweeting every fucking event 27 times. I can't do that if I'm fucking spewing out my fucking review two minutes later. I hope you guys understand. I know so many other in the community do that, right? They're trying to get that quick payday. They're trying to get your money real quick, right? I can get the most views right here. I can get some extra subs right now if I, if I get this out ASAP. I don't do that shit, man. I'm in this for the love of the game and to change the game. Not Triple H. <laughs> He's fine. The Amplified Man. We'll do it again tomorrow morning, guys. By one tally. This was bad. Can they rectify this? Can they win by at least one tally for tomorrow morning's review? For now, check you later.